Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, California, and directs their Computational Neurobiology Laboratory and the Crick's Jacobs Center for Theoretical and Computational Biology. He's also a Professor of Biological Sciences at UC San Diego, where he is co-director of the Institute for Neural, Neural Computation. One of the great pleasures of being uh, co-chair of the department is getting to meet some of our outstanding alumni. And uh, Terry was born in Cleveland and did his Bachelor's of Science in Physics, um, beginning at Case Institute of Technology and graduating from Case Western Reserve University. And then went on to Princeton where he did a master's degree with the legendary John Wheeler and then a PhD in physics with John Hopfield. Um, and somewhere there he, he made this change uh, that the, uh, uh, this you know, change of direction or, or uh, that, that led him to a postdoc in their biology department and then up at the neurobiology department at Harvard Medical School. Uh, from where he went off to Johns Hopkins University as a biophysics faculty before moving to uh, San Diego. Dr. Sijanowski's research in neural networks and computational neuroscience has been pioneering, uh, perhaps most famously together with Jeffrey Hinton, when he, uh, with whom he demonstrated that simple neural networks could be made to learn tasks of at least some sophistication. Um, there are awards that are too many to, to list. I'll mention a, an HHMI investigator, NSF Presidential Young Investigator, um, the Swartz Prize at the Society for Neuroscience. And strangely, only in 2014, uh, uh, he became a fellow of the American Physical Society. Um, Terry is one of only three living scientists who've been elected to all four of the National Academies, the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Inventors. His most recent book, uh, The Deep Learning Revolution, was published uh, by MIT Press in June 2018. Um, the long range goal of his research is to understand the computational resources of brains and to build linking principles from brain to behavior using computational models. And today he will tell us about traveling, wa traveling waves in brains. So it's my pleasure. Please join me in welcoming uh, Terry Sijnowski. Well, thank you. thank you very much for that introduction. It's wonderful to be back, uh, if only virtually. Uh, but uh, actually, I, I was on a wonderful um, uh, Zoom meeting, which is uh, going to plot the future of physics at Case Western. So I'm, I'm catching up on some of the new, new uh, uh, efforts that are being made there. So I'm uh, looking forward to the, continuing that in the future. So uh, today, let me... Uh, start by sharing my screen and telling you a little bit about where I came from. Uh, so good, can, can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, so this is the Salk Institute where I work um, and uh, it's pointing toward the ocean. Um, and the you know, the, the, I've been here now for over 30 years and uh, I, I've seen many, many students uh, and postdocs who have uh, really opened up a whole new window into brain function. And I'm gonna tell you about the most recent window that we've opened, which I'm really excited about. But before that, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, how I got to Princeton. So when I was an undergraduate case, I read this book uh, space time physics uh, by Taylor and, and Wheeler. Uh, it was not special relativity, but you know, in Wheeler's inimitable style, it was extremely clear, well illustrated, and uh, and I eventually became a student. Uh, in fact, the first day in his uh, office, in his I went to his office uh, and asked if uh, I could work with him, and he said sure. Uh, and, and and then he said I, I have a really great problem for you. Said, what would it look like if there's a black hole in the middle of our galaxy? <laughs> and and uh, you have to understand that relativity at that time, and this is 1968 or so, was a mathematical exercise looking for uh, analytic solutions to uh, the field equations, Einstein's field equations. And uh, and John wanted to make it into physics. He said, well, let, let's imagine, you know, the, the Schwarzschild solution. Uh, if it's not just a singularity, what if it's real? What would it look like? I mean, 
if you if, if they're you know of different sizes and different places and so forth. And so I went off and I did some. I was doing some computer simulations and I came back and I said, well, it would swallow stars and it would put out a tremendous amount of energy uh, as the stars pass the event horizon, be torn apart and so forth. And he said, Terry, that sounds like a quasar to me. So fast forward, as you know, this year, the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of a black hole and in, indeed in the uh, center of our galaxy. And, uh, and Wheeler really had the, prescience to uh, actually even imagine that. Uh, by the way, on the left here is a lecture he gave on his 60th birthday symposium. I was there. <laughs> and and, and he, this is one of his uh, real uh, you know, illustrations of this, you know, here's a trap. Uh, and here's another warning, impossible to quantize. Uh, someone else is saying gravity has nothing to do with physics. Uh, black holes are unobservable, right? These are all the naysayers you have to go up uh, through in order to get to uh, it, uh, something that is uh, important in physics. And, I'm, and I've sort of been through the same thing in, in neuroscience, and I'll, I'll tell you why as we go on. Well, first of all, uh, if you look at the brain, it's really the most complex system in the known universe, but it has structure and function at every single level between the molecular and the entire central nervous system. It's about 10 orders of spatial magnitude. And most of what we know about the function of the brain, now there, there's something we learn everywhere, but uh, there, there, you know, originally we uh, understood the electrical signals because we could record from the scalp, uh, Hans Berger, uh, weak microvolt signals, but these were uh, very difficult to interpret because they were uh, by volume conduction, they had been smeared, uh, filtered through the scalp. And then uh, down here at the, at the bottom, we, we could look at uh, single neurons anatomically. Uh, and it was only in the, about the middle of the 20th century that it was possible to record from one neuron at a time. And we made tremendous progress because we found that the properties of neurons in the visual system are uh, very, very selective, responding to specific uh, features of the visual image. and Here's the problem, okay, we spent 50 years doing that, recording not just from the visual system, but from the auditory system, from the motor system, uh, from the prefrontal cortex. And the problem is that it's almost impossible to put a, that together, recording from one neuron at a time. If there's 100 billion neurons, and this is, just to give you a, an analogy, it's as if you were trying to figure out what's in a picture by, looking at the picture through a straw, one pixel at a time, right? I mean, it, it, you, you can sort of get statistics and you can sort of get the idea that there are big places where the intensity doesn't change, but it, you really are missing the fact that it's the uh, interactions between the pixels that has the information, not the individual pixels or, or has very little. So, the, but that's where we were. And, and, and now uh, new techniques have been developed. Uh, and here's an example of another space-time diagram. This is methods, spatial temporal methods for recording from neurons. So for example, this is the single unit approach that we're recording from one neuron at a time. Uh, you can do that uh, from milliseconds all the way up to days if you hold on to the same neuron. But then you can record from many neurons simultaneously, uh, field potentials, which is kind of an average. Uh, here's the EEG up here. Uh, brain imaging uh, is, has become very important, but again, it's low spatial temporal resolution. But now uh, we have, uh, we can with uh, optogenetics, which is here, uh, record from hundreds of neurons. And in fact, uh, now it's uh, with the, the brain initiative, we can record from hundreds of thousands of neurons simultaneously. So that's no longer a limitation. And that's what I want to tell you about today is a discovery that was made and could never have been made by one recording from a single neuron, but required the ability to record simultaneously from a large number of neurons. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a story about what happens in your brain when you fall asleep. And uh, as you fell asleep last night, you went through several stages from awake down to uh, slow wave sleep. And that's shown here on the right. This is. Uh, uh, EEG recording, and uh, you can see that it's very low frequency. It's about two to four hertz and high amplitude compared to the awake state where the frequencies are broader, higher frequencies and lower amplitude. 
But I'm going to be focusing on stage two. Stage two sleep is intermediate between awake and slow wave. And that's shown here. And there is a peculiar grapho element, uh, it's called, uh, that is say a brief uh, burst of activity that lasts for one or two seconds called a sleep spindle. And uh, it's about 10 to 14 Hertz. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's about 50 microvolts, but it recurs over and over and over again during sleep. You, in fact, you can't go between, uh, you know, stage, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, awake, uh, uh, you come up and down during the night between slow wave and rapid eye movement sleep, that's a dream sleep, but you can't go between these states unless you stop at stage two. So stage two, you spend, some people spend half the night and thousands of these sleep spindles. And here's what we know about them. We know that these sleep spindles are very important for integrating the experiences you've had during the day into your long-term memory. So it's kind of a consolidation of your experience. And, um, and I won't tell you the evidence for that, except that it's, uh, we, we have very, very strong evidence for that. Okay, so let's, let's take a look and see what they look like if you record from single neurons and from uh, different parts of the brain. So first of all, uh, if we look at the top uh, on a five second scale, we can see that these bursts here are the sleep spindles that occur uh, simultaneously in the cortex and in the thalamus. So here are six electrodes placed in the thalamus. So we know that the thalamus and the cortex talk to each other, so this is not too surprising. But now the question arises, and by the way, this is a blow up, so you can actually see um, the, it actually starts in the thalamus. The, we know that the thalamus initiates the, the spindles, but there's a reciprocal connections with the cortex, so uh, they become entrained. But, uh, but now the question is, how synchronous is it across the cortex? And um, Mircea Steriot, who I collaborated with for uh, 15 years, thought it was, it, it based on you know, his recordings, it looked like it was simultaneous uh, you know, in phase. But we'll see that um, if you look really, really carefully, if you do a careful analysis, it's not perfectly synchronous. I wanna th throw in a historical note here. Uh, these sleep spindles were discovered by Alfred Loomis. So uh, I, I don't know if, how many of you know him, or who he was. Uh, he was a, uh, a lawyer. Uh, he had, was in a firm and invested heavily in Wall Street in the 1920s. In 1928, he realized there's a bubble, so he pulled out all of his savings from, or all of his investments from the stock market, invested it in gold. And when the stock market crashed in 29, he bought up stock at you know, bargain prices and became independently wealthy. So what did he do? Well, he decided that he wanted to set up a, a lab, a physics lab, in fact, a biophysics lab, up in Tuxedo Park, which is four, 40 miles north of New York City. And there he had bought the best equipment. He, he was probably better equipped than any physics lab at, at that time for making measurements. Uh, he was specifically interested in EEG recordings. And in the process of, of reporting, as you can see here, uh, he, uh, you know, th th these regular bursts lasting one to one and a half seconds at 14 per second appear. And, and he designated these spindles because that's what they appeared like. So he went on to uh, do things like uh, he invented Loran, uh, which is, uh, was a, a navigation uh, signal. Uh, uh, he approached control. And then during World War II, he, was, uh, he used his personal fortune to fund early work on radar at the uh, at Lincoln's labs. And so, because of all of his accomplishments, he was inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. So this is really quite a singular uh, uh, career. Okay, so I had the opportunity to collaborate with uh, a team at Massachusetts General Hospital that were, were trying to help epilepsy patients. So if you have epilepsy, it's very debilitating uh, because it can attack any time. And when it does, you lose control of yourself. Uh, 
many different forms of epilepsy. And some of them are drug resistant. That means that they've tried to control them with drugs and which work in many people, but in some it's not. And the last resort is to go in and take out the focus where the uh, epilepsy is originating from. And they do that by putting in a grid of electrodes. Uh, on the, uh, it's invasive, they have to take out a bone flap, but, uh, and, and the subject, the patient is going to be recorded from continually for weeks at a time in order to get you know, a, a, many, many uh, of these uh, seizures and look very carefully at the progression, where it starts and how it progresses. And it's different for different seizures, different people. Now, what's shown here on the right is a recording uh, from this array during a sleep spindle. And, and you can see that uh, in gray are the individual electrodes, uh, which are on the surface of the cortex. So this is not, it's not, it's not in the cortex, but it's, it's getting a signal, which is an average over probably thousands of neurons. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's uh, giving us important temporal information, millisecond uh, to, uh, resolution. But you can see the average gives you the, the kind of signal that you would expect uh, from a sleep spindle and uh, at, at about 100 millisecond period. And now what I'm gonna do is, is to play for you a movie in which we are going to color each electrode with a value from minus one to plus one normalized of what the voltage is, the, the, the current value of the uh, amplitude as a function of time. And you can see here that the, the, the red one is the, the black, but the others actually uh, you know, are kind of dispersed between it. But we, in order to see the pattern, we're gonna play the movie so you can see uh, the overall pattern of how it's changing. Okay, uh, so if you just follow the white dots, it goes from the temporal cortex to the parietal cortex to the prefrontal cortex. So it goes T, P, F, T, P, F. Can everybody see that? So this is really quite remarkable. This is a traveling wave. It's a circular traveling wave. And uh, it, is, it, it really raises all sorts of inter interesting scientific questions. Um, and we did an analysis. Lyle Muller, who was a postdoc in the lab, uh, realized that we could use methods from physics, and in particular from fluid dynamics, to track the phase. And these little arrows are pointing in a direction of maximum increase in phase. So you can see the, the phase plot here of, of that circular pattern. And we can do that for every cycle and thousands every night. And uh, we did this for six subjects that uh, had different kinds of epilepsy. And they all had these fascinating patterns. Some of them, uh, about half of them went TPF and about uh, a quarter of them went actually in the opposite direction, which is even more intriguing, right? And, and, and other more complex patterns like uh, it, it might uh, be a radial display of moving phase. We call these princess layaways. <laughs> Uh, following uh, the pattern of, of her hair, her in, put up in the bun here. Okay, well, this is, this is the observation, and we, we've done a lot of uh, work on analyzing them, but I'm, I'm going to tell you about four projects that came out of this, uh, which uh, has to do with, first of all, uh, a concern. It has to do with the fact that our pa the recordings were done in epilepsy patients, so how do we know that this occurs in normal cortex, uh, maybe it's an artifact. Okay, well, we'll, we'll attack that. Uh, what are the biological mechanisms? I mean, how does it arise? Um, are these traveling waves just an epiphenomenon or the influence behavior? Um, and finally, what is their computational function? So these are all interesting issues and I'm gonna go through them one by one. So first of all, let's look for normal uh, brains. So obviously, we're not going to be able to do the invasive <laughs> recordings that we did with the epilepsy patients, but we can record from babies. Turns out babies spend half their time sleeping, and because their skulls are soft and the sutures haven't closed, their uh, spindles are enormous. They're, you know, the, the, they're really uh, very easy to detect, and we have a ton of data. In fact, here in the in a, a power spectrum, you can see the peak here at about 10 hertz. 
So here's what a baby looks like sleeping uh, with a high density array of, uh, of EEG electrodes. And we're gonna have the same type of display, except now it's gonna be uh, two hemispheres. And, and I'm gonna rotate this so you can sort of see all of the, uh, you know, both hemispheres. And it's uh, going to have the same um, black white variation that you saw before. Okay, so it is even more complex than we thought. You can see it rotating around uh, both hemispheres. So this is very, very, uh, uh, you know, coordinated. This is a global, globally coordinated pattern. And this is in a normal baby. So we're pretty convinced that this is something that happens in, in, in your brain every time you go to sleep thousands of times. Uh, we looked at babies from three to nine months and, and uh, TPF was uh, not the most common well, at, at during the first three, uh, six, uh, at, well, let's see, uh, during the first uh, three, uh, and six months, uh, the, the uh, TFP were more common. And then over time, more and more of the, uh, we're going in the, in, the, in the clockwise direction. And uh, that continues to increase into adulthood. Okay, biological mechanisms. Okay, this is something we know an enormous amount about because of the fact that we can record and look biophysically at each one of these neurons in the cortex and in the thalamus. And, uh, it, 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 it's possible to record not only in vivo, like you saw with Mirchisteria, but also in slices. And we collaborated with Dave McCormick, who recorded from these thalamocortical cells that project into the cortex, and also a, a thin layer of inhibitory cells around it called the reticular nucleus and uh, of the thalamus. And, and it turns out that the, this is the mechanism that generates the sleep spindle. It's, it's the back and forth between the excitatory and inhibitory inputs and ion channels that are in the membranes. And we've developed, uh, uh, not me, I, I mean my uh, postdocs, Alan Destex and Maxim Bajanov and others, very detailed biophysical models of the generation of the sleep spindle in the thalamus, including the initiation and the, and the uh, termination. Uh, and also uh, cortical circuits uh, projecting to layer four and then from layer six back down. So there's a loop. <clears throat> we've written a monograph. Uh, this was published in 2001 which uh, is, is probably the best, uh, it is in fact, the best understood brain oscillation uh, in terms of uh, uh, the biophysical mechanisms. And it's uh, being updated. So it'll be out next year uh, with uh, the new discoveries that I made. But now uh, I wanna start out with some modeling because I think that that's uh, of, of, uh, on a global scale because we wanna look at the whole pattern of the cortex. We were looking at, at small groups uh, as a, you know, kind of a circuit. Uh, but we want to be able to do that. And, and the, a very simple model, but can give us some intuition, is the Kuromoto model, which is uh, used for synchronizing uh, coupled oscillators. And here's, here's the equation at the top. Uh, the phase uh, is driven by a frequency, which could be different for each oscillator. But then there's another term which drives it, which is uh, driven by the difference in phase between uh, pairs of oscillators with uh, weights given by Wij, and then the overall scaling of the, that uh, perturbation. And I'm, I'm gonna uh, show you uh, an illustration of what, the, what it looks like, the dynamics for three different levels of coupling, low, kappa, intermediate, uh, and strong. So you can see with low coupling, there's very little entrainment. And, and, and at strong coupling, they're all in lockstep not necessarily the same phase, but they're all working together. And it depends on the coupling strengths of how the order that they'll have. But you can see in the intermediate coupling is in some ways the most interesting because it's a combination of both, uh, a it's, not, it's not really lockstep, but it's, it's fairly stable. And then there's, there are these others that are flipping around. So the question is now, how to apply that to the brain? So we know a lot about the uh, way that the, and anatomical connections are within the brain. There are these long range uh, association fibers that go between distant parts from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, but also some local fibers that go between neighboring locations. And in fact, we actually can use uh, uh, the, something called diffusion tensor imaging for, of, of, the, of uh, using magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and, and here's an example of what it looks like. And this gives us uh, a, a pretty good catalog of, of the connections between different areas. And so we're gonna use that, but we have to introduce a, a, 
modification of the Kuromoto model, which takes into account the fact that these axons actually have time delays in them that's measured in tens of milliseconds. The speed is about three to five meters per second. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is to put in these taus, which are gonna be uh, the, the time delay between two different areas in the cortex. And now the question is, uh, will we get synchrony or will we see something else? And I should say that remarkably, their, their, their literature on <laughs> Kuromoto with time delays is, is, is only a few papers and it's uh, perturbations from synchrony. So it's not what we want. We want to see some of uh, uh, the first order effect of what happens when you have large taus. So here's, uh, first of all, the uh, order parameter that we're going to use, uh, which is just e to the i uh, uh, theta, the, the, the phase of each of the oscillators. And it's normalized to be between uh, 0 and 1. Uh, and here what we did is to vary the coupling parameter and looked at how well it synchronized it was. And you can see for the Kuramoto model that once you get to 10, uh, it then uh, quickly saturates to something close to 1. Um, and this is what's been studied in great detail. So uh, that part is good, uh, uh, you know, but now what about the model where we have uh, the human connectome and uh, which is that uh, uh, diag with the, the picture I showed you of all the axons and uh, with the delays. Well, first of all, it takes longer to become partially synchronized. And then uh, when you get to even the strong connectivity, it sort of uh, reaches a level of about 0.6. So this is, it's, a, it's something, it's a different state and we're gonna see what it is in a moment. So uh, here is uh, now what the oscillators look like over there's like, I think we have like 800 oscillators. And uh, this is with the oscillator frequency. Uh, this is the Kuromoto model with delay, with uh, time delays at, uh, but we're, we're gonna have a fundamental frequency of 10 Hertz. We can vary that, but you'll see first 10 Hertz, which is close to the spindle frequency. So you can see T, P, F, T, P, F. So we think that this much, because of the time delays, we're seeing this uh, traveling wave, circular traveling wave, which I think is a, a possible biological mechanism. It's the actual delays which are causing this global order. Now, what if we use a different frequency? So 40 Hertz is another frequency in the brain, it's called gamma. And so let's just plug that in, everything else stays the same. And as you can see, it's chaotic. There's, there's no uh, strong global order here. There's local order, but it uh, comes and goes. Okay, so there's something special about, is there something special about 10 Hertz? We varied uh, omega from, as you can see, zero to 50 Hertz and the coupling strength from zero to 5,000. And the, this is the circular, circular correlation between phi, which is the position of the phase in the brain as it's going around and theta is the individual oscillators. And you can see that this is strongest here at around 10 to 14 Hertz, which is the spindle frequency band and at a moderate uh, coupling between roughly uh, 400 and 800. So, so this is all good. I mean, and I think we're in the right ballpark. Now there's an interesting observation that's been made. Uh, people who have studied and measured the sleep spindle in human cortex uh, have noticed that if the frequency is actually lower in the prefrontal cortex compared to, uh, which is the front of the brain here, uh, pointing to the left, uh, compared to the back of the brain, which uh, by, by, a few, by a few hertz. And that's kind of strange. Um, wh why would that be? Well, it, it, well we, uh, what we did was we grouped together all of the oscillators and, and looked at their uh, power of spectrum uh, in the in the anterior part, and then compare that to the posterior, and so you see that here, power versus frequency, and indeed the peak in the front is around tw twelve hertz, and the peak in the back is about fourteen hertz. So we've actually replicated something that otherwise is extremely uh, unusual, and and no one could actually think of why that should be or how that could be, but in fact it's emerges from our model. So we we and, and how it emerges is another story. Okay, we'd also like to analyze this. And, and so uh, Lyle uh, realized that there was a way to do that by turning the uh, phase into a complex number. Xi is equal to e to the i theta. And then to rewrite the equations uh, shown here. Uh, 
And the weight now itself is complex, where the uh, mu, uh, as you can see, uh, is, is, is going to be proportional to the uh, time delay times the frequency, imaginary. And, um, and then we make a change of variable to uh, introduce omega into the equation, and into a new variable x prime. And now we're left with a very uh, sim relatively simple equation uh, in x prime. And now we could look at the dynamics by just looking at the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix W. And if we look at the, the, the it'll be dominated by the biggest uh, eigenvalue. And so here is the eigenvector in, in which we have, uh, it's, they're complex uh, eigenvectors. So we have uh, argue, you know, mi from minus pi to plus pi. And you can see there's, uh, there's a two pi difference between the front of the brain, which is at minus pi and the back of the brain. So in fact, this is the driving uh, circular wave that you saw, and, and we, we now can sort of uh, deduce that from this uh, analytic approach. And, and again, there's a lot more work to, that could be done there too. But you know, I think we have the tools for actually getting in, making progress. However, this is a very crude model where each uh, oscillator represents you know, 100,000 neurons, and each one of them is, is firing at a different uh, uh, time. And in fact, we know that uh, the firing rate is fairly low. Uh, we're talking about 10 Hertz and it's actually fairly sparse. That is to say for any wave, only a small fraction of the neurons actually fire. Uh, there are traveling waves which are dense, but these are uh, abnormal. Like epilepsy is a case where the traveling wave, just all the neurons fire at the same time. And, and, and of course it's a bigger factory period. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at a sparse traveling wave. And so we decided we would develop a, a, a model, a, a simplified model, uh, but nonetheless, we're, we're going to put, have spiking neurons, uh, integrate and fire spiking neurons, and we're gonna have connectivity that is uh, called a ring model. It's been very well studied. So we have a ring of units and each one is connected primarily to its neighbors and, and some of them through inhibitory interneurons, which are red here. And then we put in time delays in proportion to the distance along the ring. So this is a, a, a very kind of a crude, uh, but nonetheless, as you'll see, interesting uh, model to e explore. Now, normally when uh, there's, there's literally thousands of people who have studied this ring model, uh, and typically they study it with uh, maybe, you know, a few hundred and maybe a thousand of these uh, spiking neurons and almost none of them put in delays. Uh, you know, they're more interested in what's happening in a small column where the delays are in the order of just maybe five milliseconds. But here we're talking about delays in 10, 20, 30 millisecond range. So we put in these long delays and we had a devil of a time getting any oscillation out of it because of the fact that it was so sparse. I mean, the, the degree of inputs uh, was relatively sparse and the firing was relatively sparse until we got to about 100,000 neurons. And then we, something really amazing happened. We started seeing sparse traveling waves and I'm gonna show you what they look like. So here is uh, a ring and, and the, uh, the, the value of the membrane potential is gonna be shown vertically. So this is uh, below average. And then there's some here that you can't see yet which are gonna be above average, but uh, you'll see the dynamics and the dynamics are, are fluid. And it's really quite, I think it's quite beautiful. Now, if you look at some of these peaks here, they actually go through each other. And this is something that is very soliton-like. But here, it's primarily because of the sparsity. It's the, the, the different neurons are firing to support different waves. Now, if you do a, a power spectrum, you can see it falls off like one over F. So it looks like it's noise, but it's not. Because if you do a spatial temporal Fourier analysis, you can see a very clear cut uh, velocity here which um, you can actually, you know, it represents the uh, tra traveling waves that you see here. So we, so we have, I think, this insight that uh, this is a phenomenon that occurs when you have large networks, and it's also one that is uh, really going to be a, a much more, uh, you know, we can go now dr drill down to the biophysical level. This is kind of a stepping stone down to the Hodgkin-Huxley models that I studied with LM to Stex. Okay, uh, 
So now let's get into possible uh, functions. And here I want to tell you a little bit about synaptic plasticity. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier that we think that has something with memory consolidation, and very likely that involves changing the strengths of synapses while you're asleep. And this is the best understood form of plasticity in the cortex called spike time dependent plasticity. So here's how it works. You have an input to a neuron, a pyramidal cell. And whenever you stimulate that input, you get something called a synaptic potential. Now you can also stimulate the neuron itself and you get an action potential, right? So that's the uh, spike that you see here. Now what we're gonna do is vary the time between the synaptic input and the spike. Uh, and we're going to repeat that stimulus over and over again. So here's the here's a, when we have a positive time delay. First, the synaptic input comes in pre, before, post, and we we uh, repeat that at say 10 or 20 hertz. And afterwards, we look at the strength of the synapse, and and we're plotting here the change in amplitude. And you can see that uh, if it's within a window of about 20 milliseconds, you can double the strength, increase it by 100 percent. But if you reverse the order, so it's post before pre within a 20 millisecond window and do the same stimulus paradigm, you uh, can decrease the strength of the synapse again by a factor of two. So this, this has really uh, been very well established in not just the cortex, but many other parts of the brain. And it's telling us something about the relative timing of spikes as being really important. Now, here's why we think it's important for sleep spindles. Let's, first of all, let, let's consider two locations, A and B. Uh, they're separated by 20 milliseconds. And we, we're gonna have sleep spindles at these two locations and they're gonna be, uh, let's say, let's, let's suppose that they actually were synchronous. They were completely in phase. And now let's see what would happen. This is, you know, this is kind of uh, what, you know, what people thought before. Um, so here's, here's the uh, spikes at A, and then it takes 20 milliseconds to get to B. Now when it gets to B, it's coming after the spikes in B. So this is, again, it's, it's post before pre, and if you, if you, if you pair that at 10 hertz, you're going to LTD it, long-term depression. So this will basically disconnect the entire cortex because the only thing that's possible is depression. But we know that there is a phase offset. So uh, it takes uh, you know, 20 milliseconds for the, the traveling waves to go from A to B. So here's A and 20 milliseconds later, here's B. And that's the time it takes for the axon to propagate to B. And so it arrives at about the same time. So in fact, it can within a few milliseconds either depress or strengthen. And so at end, it's gonna be within 20 milliseconds, uh, almost a knife edge here at zero. And we, we even uh, measure the, uh, the, the amount of jitter. Uh, and, and just very briefly, if you look at two successive uh, cycles, and ask how similar they are. If, if they're very similar, then it turns out that uh, you can get the, uh, the, the, the spread in, in terms of the uh, time differences, the jitter, down to five milliseconds. And, and this, uh, there are some spindles that repeat themselves 600 times during the night. So it could be that there are some that are really getting burned in. Okay, now what about behavior? Uh, this is a paper that was published just last month in October is a collaboration between my lab and John Reynolds. John Reynolds studies a non-human primate. Uh, and we did an experiment to look for the effect of spontaneous traveling waves in the awake marmoset. Uh, so these, it turns out these traveling waves are, occur not just during sleep, but also in the cortex while you're awake in different frequency bands. Why marmoset? Well, the marmoset has a flat cortex, which makes it a lot easier to record from compared to ours, which has deep folds or macaques, which are also very popular primates. So here's the marmoset. We're going to record from area MT, and it's known that this is an area that has many neurons that are selective for direction of motion. We're going to use an array of electrodes. This is the Utah array, uh, which is four millimeters on a side with 100 prongs, it's a bed of nails, goes several millimeters uh, into the cortex, and here it is placed over area MT. And here's the recording. Uh, from one neuron in that array, each dot is a spike, and each line is a single trial. And uh, what this gives you a sense of uh, that when the stimulus comes on right here, that there's a burst of firing, you know, three, four spikes, 
Uh, this is the extracellular local field potential. Here's, here's where the stimulus comes on, is the delay uh, to get into MT. Uh, but the, the local field potential records the averages of ion currents going into hundreds of neurons in the vicinity. And so you can see there's the big dip here, which is when the inside is depolarized. Okay, this is a diagram you've seen before, and we're gonna show you what it looks like uh, so you can compare for yourself. Again, this is across that array. And uh, this is a spontaneous traveling wave. So it's, uh, it's sitting there, it, what's it doing? What's it doing? It's just doing that. Uh, oh, by the way, I wanna point something out, which is actually, uh, it, it's the background. Uh, Notice that there's a lot of spiking even before the stimulus. That, that's called spontaneous activity, and it was considered to be noise. And, we, and actually, it's not. It turns out that we now, now know that it contains a lot of information, not about vision, as it turns out, but about the rest of the body and the motor system. But that's another story. OK, well, here's uh, two cycles, just to show you uh, it with the uh, snapshots, uh, red and blue, uh, red and blue. And you can see the wave is coming across the array in this direction. And then uh, that's a strong spatial structure. And here's another wave that goes across, uh, which is, isn't quite as strong. So they're in the opposite direction, the blue, blue now. So, so the, the waves come in individually and they have uh, different uh, directions and different strengths. So we wanted to analyze it. Uh, another thing about, by the way, we call these oscillations, they are not narrow band sine waves. And here's an example of what the uh, local field potential looks like. And, and so what we had to do is come up with something called general phase. So we looked at every cycle and we, which had different periods and, and then assigned a, 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 a phase to it and, and, and color coded it. Um, and then we asked the question, uh, when do the spikes occur? And, uh, and here's the generalized phase and here's the relative frequency of spikes. And you can see that when the phase is such that the inside of the neuron is, is, is depolarized toward threshold, you can see that you get more spikes than when it is out of phase. So that's a good sign because we think that the firing of the neuron has something to do with perception. So let's see if it actually does in, in a behavioral experiment. So uh, here's the experiment. Um, it's a detection uh, task in which a stimulus comes on uh, the, Fixation, acquire, hold, and then off uh, in the in to the side uh, where the electrode array is located. Uh, there, there is uh, there are neurons here that are uh, going to respond to this stimulus, but we can vary the contrast of the stimulus and change the detection. How many times did the monkey detect the stimulus? Yes or no? And here you can see that it reaches a midpoint at about 1.5% contrast, and then becomes almost perfect when it's at higher than that. So we set the contrast at one and a half so that it was missing it half the time. But now we can look to see if it made any difference what the phase was, and it did. And in fact, if this is, this is uh, the, the, the set of uh, hits where the monkey actually saw it and, and responded correctly, and you can see that uh, this is the phase uh, that was in uh, the position to depolarize the cell, but it was before the phase alignment before the actual target goes on. So this is predicting that the monkey is going to see it, right? It's not something that occurs afterwards. So it's, it's really suggests that this is causal. Uh, so with, with, with this, with, this is the first demonstration that an oscillation or traveling wave of any kind can affect perception. And we think that this is just the tip of the iceberg in the sense that we haven't really explored yet uh, all of the different parts of the brain. And, and there are many different uh, frequencies. This, uh, this, that particular uh, traveling wave was around uh, in the range from you know, 10 to 20 Hertz. Uh, it, it, again, very broadband. So uh, after we saw this, we, wanted, we went to the literature. We said, well, well, maybe other people have seen these traveling waves too. And indeed they had. So we put together a review and we did two things. We went through the literature. We found a hundred pa papers that have observed traveling waves in motor cortex and the hippocampus 
which is a part of the brain for long uh, important for long-term memory and many other frequency bands, a beta band, uh, which is roughly, uh, you know, 14 to, to, to 30 hertz, uh, and even uh, delta two to four hertz. So it, 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 it's been seen, people have seen it, uh, but they're ignored. People have ignored it because they don't know how to fit this into the traditional view, which is that, well, it's the firing rate that's important and it doesn't matter what these oscillations are doing, that's just background noise. But we also look for possible functions. The function, by, by the one I just showed you, I think is would be called stochastic resonance. Stochastic resonance in the sense that if you have a threshold, you're most sensitive, you go back and forth across it. So I, I think this may explain our results. But I think that there's uh, even more exciting possibility. And this is a paper from uh, Fizrev Letters. Uh, what they did was to drop a styro styrene ball into a bath of oil that was oscillating up and down. And they tracked the uh, pattern. As you can see, there are uh, interference waves as it bounces up and down. Now here's what they, they, they uh, determined, which is, uh, I, I think, telling us something, a principle, which is that if you take a snapshot like this of an interference pattern, you can actually invert it to, to, to discover what the pattern of bounces were, where it bounced and when it bounced, like a hologram, but now it's it's encapsulating a window of time. So this photograph is, is actually giving information not just about one snapshot, but a whole window in time. And if that's true, and, and we know that uh, stimuli in the visual cortex can actually uh, uh, elicit a traveling wave from that location. And if they interfering like this and, and the spiking is being caused by where they are positively interfering, and if that contains information about a window of time, then we have to rethink how the visual cortex represents uh, the moving world. It, and it's gonna be, uh, there's a, as many layers in the hierarchy, so it could be the window gets longer and longer as you go up the hierarchy. So this is, this is very speculative, but you know, I think we're on the verge of a, a very different picture of, of how things, how the brain represents the world and how information is flows through it. Okay, so I want now to step back and just take a look at where we've been. Okay, so we started out by looking at single neurons. We showed that if you look at an array of neurons first uh, globally, and then more locally, that you can actually begin to see global patterns. And, and you, you would never be able to see a traveling wave by recording from one neuron. So this is really a whole new world. At, and it we're just beginning to appreciate the, 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 the degree to which the brain is coordinating information flow and how these different channels may be responsible for different brain functions. So I wanna end by First, uh, thanking uh, my collaborators. So John Reynolds down here at the right-hand corner, bottom corner, uh, whose lab is right next to mine here at the Salk Institute. Uh, April Benestich, who is, uh, studies these young babies, uh, has a fascinating story about uh, gamma oscillations and the importance for maturation of the uh, auditory system and, and, the, uh, and, and, and language. Uh, she's based at Rutgers in Newark. Uh, Lyle is uh, here. Uh, he was here. He's, he's left. He is now uh, has his own position at Western up in Canada. And others uh, that have, have helped with uh, all the recordings that you saw in the humans. By the way, it, this is a gold mine. Being able to record uh, not just from the surface of the scalp, but now uh, directly from single neurons in, in depth of it has in humans it has really opened up the study of language uh, in ways that could have never been done in any non-human primate. So this is this is really an exciting time, and as I said, uh, with new recording techniques, uh, with optical recording techniques, it's possible to record from literally uh, 100,000 neurons simultaneously, and, and that's been done in zebrafish, which only have 100,000 neurons. So it's possible to record from the entire brain of a of a of a of, of a of a, of a small uh, fish, which uh, has a transparent brain. 
uh, and 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 now we have no excuses, right? <laughs> We've uh, you know always said, well, if I could record from all neurons of the brain, I could figure out how it works. Well, sorry that you know there's a Chinese curse. Maybe you get what you wish for, but here we are. Uh, it's a whole new era. And thank you very much for your attention. Harry, could I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, if you locally warmed or cooled regions of cortex, you would probably change conduction velocity and thus you would be changing the uh, phase or, or the, uh, the delays. If you did something like that, could your model predict uh, what would happen in terms of how that would change the pattern of the, of, of the circulation and also the ability to use it uh, for either perception or for uh, encoding memories? Uh, that, that is a terrific experiment uh, that could e even be done perhaps in a human. Uh, but uh, in, in the model, we, it would be, uh, we, have, we have varied, uh, a bunch of things just to check. For example, if you randomize the connections, then you, you would completely destroy any global uh, activity pattern. Um, we haven't done the equivalent of a cooling experiment, which is just to modify uh, slightly, you know, by, by you know uh, some of them. But that, we, we could do that. That's a great idea. By the way, uh, it, it has been done. In birds, uh, there's an area of, of, of birds, uh, uh, bird song, uh, a high vocal uh, area, HVC. And uh, Michael Fee at MIT cooled it. And it turned out that you know, birds sing in these notes that come out very rapidly, chi 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 chi. It basically slowed down the rate at which the bird cheeped. <laughs> it, really, it, it, it really affects the, the timing, there's no doubt about it. The other thing I would just comment because of work that I've been doing with colleagues at Vanderbilt and here is that with infrared laser light, you could actually um, warm selective regions. And so you could not only affect whole regions of brain, but you might even be able to affect much more selective pathways in, in a very controlled fashion. Oh, that's, that's an even better idea. By the way, uh, there's more uh, evidence, mounting evidence, that uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, it was known for a long time that it, it seemed to be if you do MR, you, you don't see a, a gray matter injury. You, you, you see as white matter injury, these little tiny infarctions in, in, in the white matter. And, and, and th there, th there's this, you know, th this, what this is pointing to is a disruption of the uh, of timing information or, uh, you know, the, 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 the coherence of the information going between the cortex because they have, they have trouble concentrating, they have trouble sleeping. So yeah, I, I, and there's ev also evidence, and I think this is even more exciting, that you know everybody has focused on synaptic plasticity because that's there's so many synapses uh, as as the, the the foundation for memory, the biological mechanism of memory. Well, it turns out that if you study again, these were in rodents, um, if you study changes in the white matter, it turns out that uh, when you learn uh, the, the the myelination changes, the pattern of myelination, the average myelination changes in the, in the white matter. And so why would that be important? Well, timing. Yeah, timing. And if, if STDP is the mechanism, then th th that you, you have to be able to regulate timing because otherwise uh, it, you'll, you'll be uh, randomizing your uh, potentiation and depression. Fascinating. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for the question. Great. So we have a little bit more time for some question and answers. Um, and there is a uh, question that's come up in the chat that, that follows on uh, this question about conduction delays in another context. Robin, would you like to unmute yourself and go ahead and uh, your question is a little complicated. So would you like to yeah, pose it yourself? It's, it's complicated because it's poorly formulated. Um, but I'm a theoretical ecologist. And so I think about coupled oscillators in a different context. You are seeing the traveling waves that you see because of transmission delays. Do you require a variety of transmission delays, just that there be some delays? In my context, that would be something like um, the time it takes from, to migrate from one patch to another, and maybe some patches are far away, or there's a barrier. Wondering about the requirements. 
Well, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, uh, the, the analogy would be uh, the patches, how they're organized and uh, how people, how, how the, 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 you know, the um, animals go between them. But what we did, we did do as a control was to randomize the delays between the Kuramoto oscillators and, and that destroyed all uh, co coherence completely. Uh, and it looks like the particular pattern in the cortex is such that there is this sequential uh, type of activity in, in a circular traveling wave. Uh, it, it, but it, does, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it in a circle in the sense that uh, it, it just has to have, in fact, in fact, uh, what's interesting is that in our delay model, uh, Kuramoto model, uh, it, it didn't always go in the same direction, right? Just like in the human, it sometimes went in the opposite direction, right? So, th so that suggests that there's uh, a symmetry breaking here having to do with perhaps some stochasticity and where it starts and so forth. Uh, and, and, and by the way, it, it is in, in the brain, in the cortex, uh, there, there's a lot of reciprocal connections. It's not just feed forward, it's also feedback. So that may also be important. And is it just nearest neighbor connections or do you have long range connections? No, no, we have long range. In, in fact, we took the connectome, which has both. So, you know, we have the whole, you know, the, the, the all of the ones that are we think are important, but, you know, it, it could be incomplete, but uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's fairly robust to the exact pattern of connectivity. It's the statistics of the connectivity that may be important. I, I'm going to pose a, a, another related question and then pick some more out of the chat. Um, during aging, uh, sometimes people complain of a degradation in the quality of sleep or in the changes in the ability to form memories. <clears throat> Are there uh, systematic changes in the conduction properties, conduction velocities in the aging brain, as well as perhaps thinning of thinning of the density of connections? And uh, does, can, does this tie in together with, you know, making transitions between different sleep stages and, and, and having the spindles occur and, and so on? Well, it, the sad fact is that as you get older, uh, sleep degrades uh, shorter periods of sleep, uh, less time in sh slow wave sleep, which is the restorative sleep, uh, during which we think that the actual plasticity occurs, at, at least for uh, the hippocampal uh, declared memory. There's another story, uh, you know, which has to do with uh, learning motor skills, uh, and and there's evidence there that that may happen during uh, REM sleep, uh, rapid eye movement sleep. But uh, the the other problem is that uh, sleep can also be disrupted by any dis any other disorder. <clears throat> if you have uh, hypertension or obesity. Uh, and, and, and actually one of the biggest problems is, uh, uh, what, what is it called? When uh, you, you, your uh, airways are, are blocked when you're sleeping. Sleep, sleep apnea. apnea. Sleep apnea, sleep apnea. right. right. And, and, and the, that's the worst thing that can happen is if sometimes you know, people uh, are not breathing, they don't know it for you know, a minute. And you know, that, that can really, uh, if you do that every night, you know, that can affect a lot of uh, your physiology, but especially the brain, because it's periodically getting starved of oxygen. Um, there's another question I'll pull out of the chat uh, um, about the, the sharpness of the transitions in the wave patterns. Do the wave patterns, you know, develop smoothly or, or are there sort of um, phase transition like, like behaviors that you see? Oh. Okay, so okay, so uh, let me. Th there's two sides. First of all, quite independent of the sleep spindles, I'm telling you about. Uh, there have been both experimental re uh, recordings and um, primarily in tissue culture, but also in or organotypic cultures, but uh, showing that there may be fa uh, phase transitions occurring in the activity pattern. So the, the, and, and you know. And, 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 and uh, from what I've showed you, there's also, uh, uh, you know, uh, very important to have the, the cortex uh, aroused uh, close to threshold, but not too far. So you're always at this boundary be between not enough activity and too much. And so there's maybe a phase transition there too, but th that's kind of speculative. 
But what's interesting about the sleep spindles is that we actually know what triggers them. And it has to do with something called a sharp wave in the hippocampus. So let me back up and tell you what happens um, during these sleep phases. So during the day, information goes through the cortex and it, it, it uh, goes through a whole hierarchy of stages, which are more and more abstract. And then they all feed into the hippocampus. So that hippocampus is getting a global picture of what's going on in you know, practically the entire cortex. And we know that if uh, you have damage to the hippocampus or if it's taken out because of epilepsy, you will never be able to store a long-term memory. That is to say, you'll be able to, short-term memory is normal, but you can't remember a, something that happened to you five minutes ago, right? So it's important for memory consolidation. Now, here's what we know is that during uh, this, this uh, period of intermediate sleep when uh, stage two, the hippocampus is bombarding the cortex with replay. It actually replays sequences of ac activity patterns of neurons, you know, things that have happened during the day back to the cortex. And, and that creates uh, this, the spindles. The spindles then take off and then you get these traveling waves, right? So there's there, that, it seems to be a, a two-stage process. And, and so we, we think that there's, that there's some kind of phase transition that occurs within the hippocampus to, to, to create the sharp wave. It's a spontaneous burst of, of spikes that, that, that then bombards the cortex. And that's, that's fascinating too. Uh, these, uh, you know, what, what's, what's uh, generating them and which pattern will be uh, projected. And, and there's a tremendous amount of work that's been done in rodents. Uh, and, and this is, by the way, not only do you have a, a, the, the feed, the, the, the sequence of events that the rat has experienced in the right order, but you also have it reversed. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, you're, you're backtracking too, as well as uh, thinking ahead. How did you get there? Right. Um, so <clears throat> there's a question uh, from Annette about, uh, about neurotransmitters. Annette, uh, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and pose your question? And we'll, we'll wrap this up at about 10 after the hour. So uh, uh, maybe if Terry has a few minutes later, we can have a little chit chat, but uh, we'll, we'll formally close about 10 past. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was just curious um, if there was anything, um, if you noticed anything with like, uh, you talked about several kind of disease states or um, um, sleep trouble states. I was wondering if there were any neurotransmitters that were the like, elevated transmitters or any effects with neurotransmitters or like um, depression, tricyclic, um, neurotransmitter affection, dopamine, all that kind of thing, if there were any effects with the waves, frequency, or? Um... Well, the, the, the answer is a tremendous amount of literature on uh, what happens in your cortex uh, when you fall asleep and the different sleep stages. I'll just t tell you a few. So first of all, uh, the, 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 you know, all the neural, most of the neuromodulators, uh, you know, for, we're talking about serotonin, uh, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, um, the, which are act, during the day, they're, they're active and they keep your cortex, uh, you know, uh, aroused. But uh, when you fall asleep, they all downregulate. And what happens is that this um, avails uh, some low threshold currents that normally, when it's th their threshold, would not even be opening, but now they start opening. And that's what is, is responsible for these bursts uh, during the spindle. Um, and, and so th it's all regulated by neurotransmitters. Uh, when you have a dream, what's going on there is that the, the cholinergic system is being upregulated. And that throws the cortex into this awake light de desynchronized state, which presumably is why you have vivid dreams. Uh, and then there's my, here's, here, I'll give you one more uh, interesting story. And that's about uh, Zolpidum, which is a sleeping pill, otherwise called Ambien. So here, in fact, uh, you know, here's a, a couple of, uh, of, of experiments that have been done. First of all, if you have someone trying to memorize a list of words, and then you uh, let them sleep, and then come back the next day and ask, 
how many words can you recall? Well, it turns out that you can recall more if you take Ambien before you fall asleep. But that's interesting. So, I mean, and, and, and Ambien, it turns out, increases the density of spindles. So th this is a case where more spindles, better recall. Now, here's, here's the, the flip side, right? Uh, a lot of people experience amnesia. They say if they take it on an airplane trip you know, to Europe, they find themselves at the hotel and cannot remember how they got there. They don't have any memory of going in a taxi or what they did to get you know, at, the, at the desk. So it looks like it enhances this, 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 uh, this it, it's a uh, specifically, uh, let's see, I think, yeah, it, was, it, it acts at the, uh, uh, it's it, it, uh, the inhibitory neurons. Um, and, and it seems to uh, be able to, on one hand, enhance the, the remembrance of an experience, but then uh, it, it, ma it makes it more difficult to put new experiences into memory uh, after the, the drug has worn off. It's, it's as if you, you have uh, you know, some kind of a, a, an arrangement in the cortex where you know, you can, you, a drug, one drug may help you do one thing, but then it'll hurt you doing another thing. So there's just a lot of stories like that. Uh, and, and there's more and more uh, evidence that there's multiple neuro, uh, neuromodulators that actually uh, work in concert. And, and specifically, it's for depression, it looks as if the, the part of the prefrontal cortex called the anterior cingulate may be, uh, have a decreased activity pattern, uh, which is correlated with depression. And, it, and with deep brain stimulation, now it's possible to reverse that at, at, and with stimulating it. But, but that's another story. Great, uh, thank you for a lovely talk and a stimulating discussion. Um, we wanted to protect your time, so so we're going to close the the formal uh, formal goings on now that it's ten past. I don't know if uh, uh, if Harsh or Glenn wants to say a formal thank you as well. Um, we'll keep the the Zoom window open um, uh, just as if we were in a real lecture hall, and people can mill around and maybe uh, buttonhole the speaker with additional questions uh, informally. Um, if, if Terry yeah. has a few more minutes to, to hang out. Sure. Um, but let's, yeah, thank let's you, all- Thank you, Terry, for a wonderful, fascinating talk. That was, that was great. Let's feel free to unmute yourself and, and thank the speaker. And uh, yeah, come come up to the podium now and, 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 and you can by, by ask- the way, By the, by the way, uh, I, I, you know, I, I actually forgot the punchline that what I have discovered is space-time physics in the brain. <laughs> <laughs>